one of my first retaining walls, and I'm going to start backfilling it, right? So I'm going to get my, my excavator out. We're going to start dumping sand behind the pile here. Now, this sand has a really nice moisture content, so it really kind of locks together pretty well. But what I'm doing is I'm just dumping this stuff in the cylinder, just filling this cylinder up. No compaction, no reinforcement. This cylinder is just getting dumped in here, right? The material's just getting dumped in. As you can imagine, when we take away the outside form here, we're gonna lose most of the structural integrity. This is so wet that it's holding together. But all we have to do is put a tiny load on that and we'll see this stuff slump off. Now, if the sand was a little drier, we would see the sand slump off in the phi angle, right? We would see that angle denoted here on the side, but it's wet enough where it's kind of got more of its own um, uh, composure. It's going to hold together a little bit better than a dry sand would. So we saw if we don't backfill, we end up with an immediate failure. It returns back to slope with just a tiny bit of load to it, right? So now what we're going to do is we're going to introduce backfill that's also got a level of compaction to it, okay? So we're using the proper size compaction equipment for the job that we're doing. We're compacting in lifts of about an inch because that's all this thing is probably going to be able to compact. So, but again, we're scaling our equipment to fit the job requirement here, right? So we're going to keep filling up our sand. You know, every scoop and a half or so, we're going to compact it on the way up. Mike, you want to see if you can get a paver, a small paver or two? All right, so here we have that'll work. Here we have compacted sand, right? So we've gone up all the way. We've compacted it in lifts all the way up. As we remove our form, we should see this stuff stand pretty well put together, right? We've got our vertical walls. It's staying in place pretty well. But when we add a load or a surcharge to this, we can see it's starting to slump off, right? If we add another block, well, sure, we can use this one. OK, so as we add another block, we can see that immediate failure occurs, right? Even though we compacted our material, that down pressure was enough to blow out the sides of our retaining wall. Had we not used any backfill or uh, reinforced backfill and geogrid. Now, what we're going to do is do it the right way. We're going to backfill our wall, same way we did before. We're going to compact in lifts, same way we did before. But we're just going to introduce these little circles of weed fabric. And these denote geogrid. And I know I just got done saying never use a geogrid substitute, right? So you'd never use this behind a wall, but for the purpose of demonstration, it works really well. So we're going to go ahead and set our grid in, run a little more sand in there. We're going to go ahead and start compacting this material again. So this is the same thing as packing in your two to four or six inch lifts behind the retaining wall, right? We're running our vibratory plate packer uh, right up against the back side of the wall to achieve our 95% of standard proctor. So we'll go ahead and introduce some geogrid in here as well. Go ahead and pack this in. I always tell my guys, right when you think you're done packing, go another five or 10 minutes. You just can't, you can't overdo compaction, right? You wanna make sure that you have proper compaction behind these walls. We'll go ahead and do the same thing. I'm going to introduce one more layer of grid. And then we'll cap this puppy off. Same process. We're just filling up this cylinder with sand as we go up. I got a little left on the table, so I'll take and add a little bit. Compacting in lifts all the way up until we've reached top grade of the back of our wall. Now, as we pull this thing up, we're not going to see the grid lengths yet, right? You can maybe see a little bit of lip right here where the grid is showing through the face. 
But what we want to do to this now is start, start adding a surcharge or a load to it, okay? So we know that even unreinforced, it was able to hold this block up, right? So let's go ahead and start with something a little bit bigger because this is where we saw failure on the first demonstration. This is half a Versa block, 42 pounds, okay? So as I kind of wiggle this thing around, you should start to see between the layers here, you're going to start to see that phi angle appear. It's actually kind of manifesting better on the sides and the back here. But what we'll see is that a little bit of material around the edges is going to start to shed out between these layers of grid. But overall, the structural integrity is still there, right? So we've added 42 pounds. Let's double our load. Let's double our surcharge. We've got another 42 pound block on here, right? We'll go ahead and stack this on here. As long as we get this on fairly even, this thing is still able to support that load, right? That blowout's not happening anymore. The only thing that we changed between those the second and the third demonstration is that we added these layers of grid in here, right? And even as I kind of play with the outside of this and I start shaving away sand, we start to see those mini fee angles emerge, right? Those little failure planes that we talked about. You saw a lot of slides up there that kind of showed what that would look like. So we see those failure planes start to manifest around the side of this sand. Now, we could probably stack these blocks up until we break the table, to be honest with you. I've never broken one, but if you talk to Chad, he'll tell you that he has, because guys are always like, you couldn't put another block on there, and we never want to turn down a challenge, do we? So we're always trying to put on more weight, but the bottom line is, is that introducing just a little bit of soil reinforcement between these layers of sand has taken this from failing at a 40, 40 pound load to all of a sudden being able to double that and still stand up to the load. Now even after I shaved around the edges, just to prove the point, let's put one more block on there and see what happens. Somebody say, don't do it, you're crazy. Okay, so you can tell I'm not, I'm not holding this block up at all, I'm just kind of stabilizing it so that it doesn't fall on me. But this little column of sand because it's got the geogrid soil reinforcement in there, is able to carry three times, more than three times the load that we initially introduced and saw failure with, right? So the same principle is at work behind your retaining walls. So not that it's magic, but it's kind of magic, right? And this is why I kind of, I like to show my new hires this, because it just drives home how important the geo grid is and why you can't skimp on grid lengths or grid quality or the gradation of the grid. You gotta make sure and follow what your engineer specs for your wall. All right, we'll just go ahead and slide this stuff back a little bit. So that was pretty cool. There's never any questions on the sand portion. Does anybody have a question? I didn't think so. Okay, we'll jump into hands-on. So we told you that one block can do a lot of different jobs, right? One block wears a lot of different hats. You can do a lot of different things with the same standard retaining wall block because it's a solid core block. We've got some of these that are pre-split back here. Mike, if you want to start setting those blocks out, we're going to need six blocks kind of lined up right here. You want to give them a quick hand, Chris? So we've got this block here that we've split in half. Whether you use a chisel or a hydraulic splitter or a guillotine splitter, you can achieve a really nice manufactured edge by just splitting this block in half. Yeah, we're going to use these. Let's try to set them up right, right along here. We're going to use them for, for this demonstration and then we're going to move them over a little bit. So what we're setting up here first is we're going to set up an outside radius, okay? You guys remember one of the, one of the properties that Versalock has is that you can turn a maximum of an eight foot outside radius or an outside curve. Now that means, I don't know if you can see this here, but that means that this area at the back of the block is tight up against the next block, okay? That, when you have no gap, or no air between the front or the back, that's the maximum radius at which this block can turn. 
The reason that's so important, again, is that as you build up, your radius gets smaller and smaller every row you stack up. Eventually, your blocks are going to start to separate at the face like that, okay? So in order to combat that, like I said, some guys will make a jig, right? They'll have a jig that might be a half inch, quarter inch, three eighths inch. But what, what that'll tell them is that when they have that amount of distance back here, that they're set up at a nine foot, 10 foot, 11, 12 foot radius, whatever it might be, you've got a jig so that your base can be wider than that eight feet. So you'll end up at eight feet at the very top of your wall. Okay? And again, you want to make sure you do that because otherwise your blocks will start to separate at the face on you like that. So now that we've shown the outside curve, let's go ahead and move these around a little bit. We're going to go ahead and show you the inside five and a half foot radius. I told you on the, the outside radius, sometimes I'll use my pinky wedge, right? I'll take my pinky finger, and if that fits between the back of the blocks, I know I'm good to stack up to about three feet like that, right? So that's my predetermined pinky jig. Whenever you can use something simple, fast, easy, and effective, take that opportunity. Now what we're going to do is set up at an outside radius. And the reason that the engineers at Versalock have said that five and a half feet is your max inside radius is because at some point here, these guys are going to become so separated that on a quarter bond, the back of the block is going to be sitting on nothing. It's going to be floating in the air, right? So you want to respect that five and a half foot inside radius capability. Now what we'll do is straighten this wall out. Let's go ahead and grab a string line. That'll work if it... We just need one section of it. And then I'll need a couple of string line holders. That's fine. Perfect. Cool. All right, Mike, you want to give me a quick hand or Chris when you're done with that? So uh, typically, this string line is going to be spiked in, right? You're going to have a 10-inch or a 12-inch spike that you're going to knock into your class 5 base. Now, as you pull this thing straight, you can see here that along the back side, you're going to be able to come in and make these blocks even with your string line. And again, you do not want this string line to make contact with the back of the block, right? If your string line is touching the backs of any of these blocks, it's going to mean that the string line is deflecting. And whenever the string line deflects off the back of a block, it's going to cause you to build a curved wall. We like laser beams, right? We like them to be straight and perfect. And if you want a straight, perfect wall, you're going to keep this string line spaced off the back by, again, you can certainly use your pinky wedge here. All we're looking for is uniformity, whether it's a half inch, quarter inch, three eighths, whatever it is, you want to make sure that as you, as you fit your finger in behind this block wall, that the string line is the same distance off both sides of the block. It's as simple as that, and that's how you make a wall nice and straight. Straight walls are um, difficult to maintain because every row you may see a little bit of deflection or deviation, which means that you may want to take your six-foot level and bump it up against the back of this wall, right? All you're doing is you're checking to make sure that you're staying nice and straight as you stack up. Now, let's assume that we've got this base in. We know that it's nice and straight. We're going to go ahead and set our first block in. So we've got this handy lifter that uh, I know we gave a few of them away just recently here. Um, these lifters fit right into the first and fourth pinholes. And as you go ahead and set these blocks up on top of each other, one thing I always tell my guys to do is give them a shimmy, right? So you're going to take these blocks and shimmy them back and forth a little bit, it does two things for you. One, it cleans off any little bit of concrete slough or slump that might attach itself to the top or the bottom of one of these blocks. Second thing it does for you is as you're stacking these walls up, it tells you if you've got any deviations. Because as you're sliding this block back and forth, if you hit a hard lip, you know, air breaks, boom. If you hit a hard lip like that, it tells you that you have a problem with a lower row right? Your level is off a little bit for some reason. So I always have my guys 
skim these blocks off back and forth a little bit before we pin them. Now let's go ahead and let's pin our first block. Cool, thank you. So what Mike brought here is he's got two different styles of, of pins. We've got a standard VersaLock pin, right? This is gonna be used for a standard six inch tall block. And then we have what's called a snap off pin. This is what you're gonna use to pin together the accent blocks in the mosaic panel. So we see behind us here, we've got some four inch tall blocks. These snap off pins are gonna be used for that system, right? So you can just kind of pop that top off like that. And now you've got a shorter pin that's gonna fit down inside of the accent block without having it poke out through the top and cause a problem for you. Now as you're pinning these, you're gonna notice, and I'm gonna set this up for failure here, you're gonna notice that if you try to drop this pin in, that sometimes it's gonna hit the top section of the block you're trying to pin it into. There is this section right down the middle where we need to make a split to modify this block for corners. So as we're doing this, you have to bear in mind that you may not be using the first and fourth pinhole every time. Sometimes you might be using the second pinhole. And this, this pinhole is still going down into this block below, and then this pin is gonna drop down into this block. And remember, that's what we said. We need to have the block pin into two blocks below for structural integrity, right? So this block is not gonna be able to move independent. It's gonna have to be pinned into these two blocks below. And that's kind of the method behind pinning these things. And that's why we're able to pin at a variable bond, at a quarter bond all the way up to the half bond. Okay, so let's go ahead. We're gonna do GeoGrid on the outside 45. So let's go ahead and start setting up our inside, or I'm sorry, our outside 90 degree corner. So we'll take a few of these blocks. We'll just set them up right here. I've got one down there already. You know, actually though, I'd rather use the other side. Okay. So what we have here, is we're gonna show you how to do an outside 90. And I know it was already up on the slide, but we're just gonna show you in real life what it's like to put together this 90 degree corner. So Mike's gonna slide this block over to meet with this block as I slide this block into this corner, right? Now there's one thing, you wanna hand me the speed square? So as you're setting this 90 up, you can use the speed square on the back side of these blocks on the manufactured edge to make sure that you have a perfect 90. We were only off by about a degree or two there. But we'll go ahead and set up a perfect 90 degree angle by using a simple plastic speed square on the back side of our blocks. Now, we kind of talked about how you set up these outside 90s. Let's go ahead and put the next block on there. Yeah, but let's set that on there first. So remember we talked about finishing details, separating yourself from the DIY jobs, from the lawn mowing guys. Uh, this is one of those details that we already covered, but I just wanna show you in real life here, you really do see this ribbing. You see that on the top of these blocks, manifested on both sides. So this is gonna be a situation where I'm gonna flip these over And now as we stack this thing up, you're not gonna see that. It just gives you a nice finished look. And here's a little tip for you. As you're splitting these blocks in half, stack them left and right, right? So you're gonna have one stack of all left side, one stack of all right side. It's just gonna make it easier to figure out as you're stacking corners and pillars which side of the block you need to use. For corners, it's gonna alternate. You're gonna use left, then right, then left, then right. For pillars, you're gonna go all the way around with all lefts on one row, and then use all rights on the second row, okay? So as we stack this thing out, let's go ahead and slide this block back. Now we can slide these over and we're gonna go ahead and create an inside 90. If you wanna start filling this in a little bit, Yep, just like that. 
And again, we're going to be using a block adhesive here, right? The corners are going to be glued. The rest of this can all be pinned at that three-quarter inch setback. So let's stop right here. What Chris did is he started setting up our wing wall. What he did was he set this block up so that it's far enough back that we're going to be able to overlap on top of it, okay? And again, we're trying to tie these two walls together so that they don't move independently of one another, but so that they're dependent on one another, right? So we want to have kind of a marriage here in the, in the very corner where now our next block is going to overlap onto this wing wall. There we go. And this would all be glued at the corner. Now, if we had the overlap here, this block, if it was pushed over just a little further, could certainly pin into this block below it. But we are going to use an adhesive back here on the corner to attach these two blocks, right? So as we're stacking north, we know that um, the block row underneath isn't going to be sliding around on us. Let's go ahead and set that guy right there. Cool. So now, the only modification that we've had to make to this block is to split one block in half. And now we've been able to make an outside 90 and an inside 90 by just using these units as they are without any modification, right? We've only split one block in half to make this Z wall. Now let's go ahead and grab a couple of these outside 45 pieces. I'll take that one. Okay, and I just want to set this up here for the camera and for you guys to see. The only two things that we had to do to this block is we split a 45 degree angle off of the corner and typically we like to see this section saw cut, right? Uh, they split this one, but if I was in the field doing this, I would want to see a saw cut here and you're going to see why in just a second. As that block comes into the other block there, it becomes immediately obvious that there's some gapage here, right? So on a job site, that doesn't fly for me. I would be taking uh, one of these nice ash blades and cutting a clean vertical line on my outside 45. But for the purpose of demonstration, we already assumed that we have level base. We assume that we have good conditions, so we're making some assumptions. We're going to assume that we would also make a saw cut there rather than a split, right? So let's, yep, let's go ahead and stack up another one. Wow, dangerously close to perfect there, huh? So again, on these outside 45s, we're going to be putting a little bit of glue between these two blocks, but this block will pin down into the block below it over here, okay? So you can still pin these systems. It's just going to be a little bit of adhesive just to help you sleep better, just to hold this stuff together nice and tight. Let's go ahead and keep on going. We're going to keep on stacking this thing out a little bit. Put another block or two on top of there. Do we have a cobble? Yeah, let's grab one of those. Perfect. Okay. So what we've done here is we've got a Z wall that's gone from an outside 90 to an inside 90. And now we're cutting an outside 45 degree angle. And now we're going to cut to an inside 45. Okay? So all we have to do is have these two blocks meet at the corner. We've got our cobble block, which is a half unit. This is half a retaining wall block. And this is going to be our jumper. We're going to set our jumper up in here. Again, this block is going to be adhesive. We're going to use block adhesive to be locking this into place. It won't pin. So, we'll pull this guy over so it's making good contact. Yeah, let's set. 
There we go. Perfect. Maybe just for fun, let's throw two more blocks up on top here, just to show this inside 45. And while those guys are doing that, see, I know we've got some geo grid over here. Well, you know what? Let's go ahead and use this right here as a, as a demonstration uh, in place of actual grid. So when we're placing our geo grid, sometimes there's going to be a situation like what we have here and we see that we've got geo grid that's going to be interfacing with itself. Or as we run these layers back, I'm going to go ahead and move this guy. That's probably a bad spot. As we're running these layers of grid back in our 45 degree outside angle here, what we can see is that these grid lengths are going to come, on, come and make contact with each other, right? Now, we talked before about how grid is not designed to grab onto itself. It has to grab into dirt or soil. So <clears throat> what we want to do here is create a soil separator. What NCMA requires for test takers is a three-inch separation between layers of grid, okay? So where these, where these grid sections are laid back in their direction of strength, and you know, I'm going to be very careful as I put my block on here to keep my grid back far enough so that you don't see it at the face, okay? So right now, you can't see the grid at the face, but it's still making a solid contact here between these blocks. The tension is holding it in place to some extent there, right? We just need to make sure that as these two layers of grid intersect, that we get soil between them. Three inches is what NCMA requires. Now, if this is towards the top of the wall, we also want to make sure that we have at least six inches of material on top of this grid, right? If this is the very top of the wall and the engineer called for geo grid on the, on the very top layer like this, we want to make sure that we get at least six inches of material over the top of this geo grid as we're compacting. And that's just to make sure that it can operate the way that it's designed to do so. Um, let's see. Do we have any questions up till now on the geo grid or any of the angles or curves? Cool. I'm sweating already up here. I don't know if it's the lights or just moving a couple blocks, but I think I'm out of shape. Um, so we've got our Z walls, we've got our 45s. Now we're going to integrate some steps. And I told you already that steps are kind of one of the things that Versalock does really well because they are a flat block. We're going to run out of block here pretty soon. We should probably start moving some of these over. OK, now the way that we're doing our steps is as a separate component. We aren't really tying the two together in this case. Whew. So, this block here is actually going to go on the outside. Our first stair riser, I'm actually going to set back. And you can see here that uh, I've set this block back a couple of inches. And the reason for that well, twofold. One is, is you may be meeting up with a patio or a walkway, but it's really so that as the stair tread comes out and you have that eyebrow, it doesn't create a trip hazard or it's not an ankle buster, right? Because if we push this block out to be even with the face of our wall, as we attach a tread with an eyebrow to this, it's going to hang out past the face of our wall. Right? So it's just one of those things that you can do to make your job more streamlined. Set this thing back a little bit so that as we cap our stairs, we don't have the capstone sticking way out past the face of the wall, hitting people in the ankle and uh, causing problems. Yeah, sure. So this is one way that you can do it, right? You can do it one paver length 
if you'd like to, where we're insetting a paver there. And then we're going to go ahead and stack our first two stair treads up. Now, this particular design, we're going to try to do a partial exposed step, okay? So let's go ahead and stack up two more behind here. Perfect. There we go. Okay, so now we can grab a couple of these standard blocks and let's go ahead and stack up the second riser of this staircase. There we go. We're going to have a little bit of overlap. I don't know if we can zoom in on this, but uh, Joe set this up so that we're going to get a little bit of overlap onto the block below it. The front of this block is actually resting on the back of the block below it here. That's just, again, to create a level of bond. That's going to give you more structural integrity. It's going to lock everything together so that these blocks don't move independent of one another, right? We're going to use adhesive. I would drop a bead below the front of this and I would drop a bead towards the back and glue this all together. At that point, it's built to spec. The engineers are going to be happy. We can go ahead and add one more cobble piece over here, I suppose. Perfect. Cool. So, you know, what did it take us about five minutes to stack up these two treads? And assuming that you have your base material done correctly down there, it's really this easy on site. Once the compaction and the leveling is done under here, it really is just stacking glue, right? So it goes really quickly. Um, what we'll do here is we'll go ahead and why don't we start to uh, cap these stairs. We're going to do it two different ways. We'll grab that, that bullnose corner there. Thank you. Now this is something that uh, has been pre-made. We've used it at a couple of the seminars, obviously, but these are our bullnose pavers mitered across the corners so that we have a finished edge on two faces here. Let's go ahead and throw down a couple more. Now we're going to switch over to the weathered ones. So what we're doing here, guys, is we've got, um, we've got the bullnose treads. We just want to show because we're using a weathered block here, that really it's just an aesthetic difference between using a weathered bullnose tread compared to a, we really, uh, well, we really could slide this over a little bit to accommodate that. Let's go ahead and do that. A little more. A little shake, a little shake and bake. Okay, cool. So we got this to fit pretty nicely. Now I would always take a straight edge and run across the face of these to make sure that they're going to be nice and straight across here. But you can see now why we set that first stair tread back, right? It's so that we're not hitting on these treads as we walk by the wall. It's all nice and evenly lined up. Let's go ahead and use our broke face treads to cap the next tread or the next riser. Now, the reason that we wanted to use a broke face tread on the top is because sometimes the top stair is leading up to a patio, right? Now, if you have a six centimeter paver that you're using up on your patio, the bullnose is gonna work great, two and three eighths inches. Bullnose is what you wanna use. However, if you're using a slate stone or a euro stone or a decra stone application, that's a seven centimeter paver, more like two and three quarters inches in height. So that's where it's really nice to be able to just split the face of these blocks and create a rough texture that matches your block, right? And then it's also gonna match the height of the paver behind it. And if you look here, you can see that it makes a difference. We're using a seven centimeter paver behind this here, so it matches the height of our tread. If we had used a shorter paver, there'd be a trip hazard there. And I think we actually have one more right behind you there.
Yeah, that, it's right by your foot there, Mike. We'll just go ahead and throw that up on there so it looks finished. Okay, the next thing we want to do is, uh, as part of this design, we sold, we upsold a pillar or a column, right? So we know from the stuff that we've already seen that a pillar is super easy to build. All we have to do is split blocks in half. This is where it gets to be really important to separate left from right. We did that as we stacked these up. We set all the right-hand blocks on one side and all the left-hand blocks on the other side. We did that so we didn't have to look stupid in front of everybody trying to figure out which side goes on which row. Because as you're stacking up, each row is going to be all lefts and then all rights and then all lefts and then all rights again, right? So we're going to separate those out as we stack them. What happened to our left-right thing here? <laughs> Somebody... Somebody mess with our mojo here. Um, so all we're doing with this pillar is we're chasing our tail around again, right? We're going to try to create bond with each row that we stack up. I like to use a square or some sort of a piece of equipment to make sure that we're stacking these things square. But once again, there are two manufactured edges that are going to meet when we stack these pillars up. So you can look at that gap to kind of decide whether or not you're perfectly square or not. That's, uh, I, I, I highly suggest everybody invest in a, in a nice pair of uh, boots that have a toe wedge included on the tip. That way, if you have to kick a few over, you can just use your toe wedge along with your pinky jig. All right, so we're going to stack this up a couple of rows. We'll go, we'll go one row higher after this one, I think. Let's go up three. One really nice thing about Versalock is that because you're able to use the same standard block to create half splits and back split blocks, you can kind of seamlessly transition between traditional retaining wall applications and freestanding wall applications, right? So that's one thing that we're going to do here on the corner. Well, you guys are doing that. I'm going to go ahead and get this freestanding wall started. Let's go ahead and grab a couple of those standard freestanding blocks. I want to point something out here. What we have is um, the freestanding block. If you want to set that down, Mike, that thing looks heavy. Um, the freestanding block is our traditional retaining wall block with the back two inches split off of it. Right? It's not a special unit that you have to order. This is the standard block unit. It's just got the back end of it split off so that it has a matching face to the front here, okay? So, what we've done is called an off-center split. This is a back split block, freestanding back split block, that has also been split off-center. We didn't split it right down the middle because in order to get any level of bond with a freestanding application, we have to do an off-center split. And you'll see what I mean by that. So let's flip this guy over so we don't see those rib lines, right? We'll flip this guy around. Okay, so what we have here is a freestanding wall that is now flush on the inside and the outside, right? There's no gap between these blocks. So we'll go ahead and stack up our next off-center split behind here. And you're going to see why it's so important to do an off-center split now. Because if you look right here at the back, you can see that the next block that we're going to stack on this is going to overlap over two blocks. And what that means is that this is never going to have a tendency to separate or lean forward on you as you're building a freestanding wall. If there was no bond there, there would be a chance that these things could separate from the main portion of the wall. So we have to do an off-center split. Now we talked about being able to pin on variable bond, but we don't have four inches here, 
right? There's no way that's four inches. So this is one of those situations where we're gonna have to cut a block in, a slug. We never wanna cut anything smaller than four inches, so here we're gonna use a five inch slug, okay? We'll pop this in right behind there. You can see now we've got more bond and actually the camera is showing the side where we have a lot less bond. On this side, we have at least four inches of bond over here, okay? So as we're stacking this thing up, you know, and maybe I'm just gonna reverse this despite the fact we're gonna show ribs because I wanna drive home the point that we can create or get back to almost a quarter bond by cutting a slug in here, right? So now you see we've got a good overlap there. Now we don't necessarily have to do anything else to stay on like a quarter bond as we pin these there, as we uh, glue this wall back. Let's go ahead and throw one more block up here. One more freestanding block, there we go. Cool. So now we've got all kinds of different elements here. With any other manufacturer, you'd have to call and order special corner units, you'd have to call and order special stair units, you may even have to order special 45 units if they even manufacture something like that. But with Versalock, we've got one block that we did all these different jobs with. Freestanding, outside 90s, pillars, stairs, multi-angles, curves, all done under the same umbrella with the same single block by just making a few simple modifications. I've been beaten up upselling all day, so let's talk about something that we can do to add a little bit of aesthetic interest to one of these projects. We're gonna go ahead and add a band of black through our freestanding wall. This is something that I do quite regularly on my projects. I might add, um, I might add a contrasting color to my wall. Now, this is the sake, you know, for the sake of uh, demonstration. If this was on somebody's home project, we would probably be mitering these corners in to do this banding, right? But for the sake of demonstration, we would also be using an adhesive on this thing. We'd be gluing these things down and then setting a block on top of it to go ahead and hold that load in. Whenever, was that? Yep, so uh, what Joe's got here, if you just show that to the camera, this is gonna be our mitered corners for this. Now, one really nice thing about adding a row of banded block through here is that it naturally lends itself <clears throat> to another upsell. Maybe you wanna add some lights. You wanna do some LED lighting, add some banding, you know, two birds, one stone. We've done now an accent band through here. We can use this channel that we've created between the pavers to actually integrate some lighting into this project. Pretty cool. So now we've downlit our entire wall. The other cool thing about the pavers is that between the chamfers here is a great place to run that wire. And so you've got kind of a natural conduit here. You don't have to do much fabrication to add a light. Let's go ahead and set that three-piece capstone up on here, see how that works out. Hercules! Okay. Try to get that on there fairly evenly. It probably needs to come forward a little bit, huh? And my way a little bit. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. So, you know, very little additional effort was required here, but now we've got something that's, that's well above standard. It's superior to all the cookie cutter stuff that everybody else is doing, you know? You've thought outside the box um, in this downlighting, I think is really doing a good job of selling us too on why we're gonna flip our blocks upside down, right? Uh, so that we don't see these channels in here. If this was somebody's job, we would of course be flipping that block over, especially if we're gonna downlight that area and make that a highlight area. But uh, really nice aesthetic to that all of a sudden, right? All we had to do is add banding and a contrasting cap. This is one of Versalock's new coping caps this year. This is actually a faux natural stone cap or a coping piece. They've done a really nice job making improvements over the years to this mix where this looks just like snapped blue limestone to me. I mean, it's incredible how, light, how, how uh, realistic these coping stones can get now. Um, Willow does a great job with these. This looks very natural. So now we're gonna talk about the pillar. We're gonna integrate the same, the same upsell to our pillar, okay? Now, 
for the sake of continuity, if we were doing a patio down here, I would imagine that we would be matching this accent band that we're doing through our freestanding wall, right? We'd be uh, tying these components together so that it looks planned, so it doesn't look like an afterthought. You always want to be thinking about ways to make your colors uh, jive between different components, right? So if you're going to do an accent that's black over here, you may do an accent in the patio that's black. But for the sake of demonstration, we're actually doing a light accent row through this. Now you can see that in this case, we have gone ahead and mitered these corners together to give it a really nice finished look. And again, part of what we're doing here today is trying to show you different variables or different uh, approaches, different ways to do things. Once again, there's always you know, going to be a different way to peel an orange. One may not be better than the other, but it's important to know what's out there, uh, what kind of methodology is available to you. And so for this case, we're going to go ahead and switch up the color of our pillar accent because we're going to use a black cap on top. So we're kind of reversing that contrast. Like I said before, high contrast designs are really what's in right now. Everybody likes that black-white contrast, right? Whenever you can have a light color next to a dark color, it makes it pop. It makes it that much better. So once again, we mentioned that with a with a with the pillar, the 20 by 20 pillar, you end up with a 4 by 4 conduit up the center so you can run your electrical wires up through the pillar and then you can add some nice LED features like what we have right here. Um, are there any questions on the freestanding or pillar applications? Awesome. Awesome. Okay, we've talked about the geo grid. We've got the inside outside 90s done here. Um, talked about upselling. Always be using an opportunity to, uh, to elevate yourself over you know, the competition. It's like I said before, we might all be some, at some level, we're competitors, but at some level, we're all working together here too, right? We're trying to keep our industry, uh, we're trying to keep a high level of quality for the entire industry, industry wide. That's why we do these educational seminars so that everybody's on the same page. We all know there's, there's a method to the mayhem, right? So use these opportunities to upsell, you know, whether it's weathered block, accent uh, bands through the seat walls, maybe it's a different colored capstone. Always be thinking about ways to upsell your project. Before we head out, we'll just quickly cap this mosaic wall that we have built over here. Because there is one thing on this that I want to show as well. Although the camera may not be able to see it at this point. Um, yeah, we built, we built a pretty nice divider wall there, didn't we? Um, for our mosaic wall, we're just going to slap some caps up on this thing, show you how to do the eyebrow. Yeah, that's probably a good idea, Joe. We'll stack that down a little bit. We talked about devils in the details, right? It's the little things that matter, the small changes that you make that set you apart from the homeowner DIY type uh, YouTube projects, right? So instead of just ending this retaining wall, with this manufactured edge. And what I say by end is I'm talking about over on this side right here, and I think the camera can kind of get in there. We don't necessarily want to show this manufactured edge to the capstone, same as we don't like to show the manufactured edge on our retaining wall blocks. Super simple things that we can do to hide that and make it look much more finished. Now what we've done here, is gone ahead and figured out ahead of time what size our splits need to be. So in order to do that, as we set this block in here, what we're going to do is we're going to measure this distance from the corner to where our step up is. So say it's 34 inches. We're going to divide that by three and try to come up with a median number so that we end up with even block segments. We don't want to have a little teeny slug cut into this. That makes everything you've done up till this point 
almost worthless to, to inject small slugs into this. So ahead of time, we figured out that we were going to need like a 10 inch split here, right? So we've gone ahead and we've split this block off on this side so that we're finished on two faces, right? And then as we marry these two and push forward to do a little bit of eyebrow action, we've used a half split on the end here, right? This half split now has finished texture on both the face and the side. So we use that to our advantage now. And we're going to go ahead and set this block up on top of that block. We've got a little bit of extra overhang there, and I think it's because we didn't do quite enough on this other side. This one was set up to have about an inch and a half eyebrow. But whatever you want to do, it doesn't have to be an inch and a half. It could be an inch, it could be three quarters, whatever you want to do for your eyebrow. The only thing that we have to do to make this corner and cap this corner is we have to make this split and we have to make one cut. We've got this block here, this capstone. All we've done here is taken our speed square, scored a line, and then cut this side off so that it's going to go ahead and butt right up to our corner piece. Now, there is a top and a bottom to these capstones. You can always tell because the front of the cap is going to have a little bit of a bevel to it. If you're as detail-oriented as I know you are, that might bother you a little bit. You certainly can take a chisel along here and kind of recreate just a little bit of bevel there if you want to, right? Just to keep that level of continuity there as you're capping these things. Because, of course, as Mr. and Mrs. Smith are walking outside to look at their wall, the cap is kind of the first thing they see, right? So spend some time on the capstones and make sure the cuts are clean and the splits are in good places. Make sure you don't have weird little slugs put in there. All you have to do is figure out your total width and then divide it. And you'll find out exactly what size these two splits need to be so that they are uh, at least comparable in size. So you don't have a huge slug over here on the corner and then a tiny slug over here on the other side. Any questions on capping? Awesome. Okay, well I'm sweating pretty good <laughs> right about now. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to cover on the hands-on portion? I think we've covered it. Is there any questions overall from the seminar today that you didn't get to ask before that you want to cover now?